Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. Tonight, we start up a new book, and not just any book. This is a book we've been building up to for years and years. Tonight, we talk about Till We Have Faces by C.S. Lewis. Um, this book has been nominated almost every time we've done an election for the Mythgard Academy. Um, by the way, a little side note. If I'm remembering correctly, this year, um, we're, the Mythgard Academy is now 10 years old. Um, so we've been doing this for quite some time. Anyway, um, in the last 10 years, Till We Have Faces has been nominated almost every single time. And um, it's been a finalist at least two or three times. Um, and it finally won the election. Um, so um, we're, I'm delighted. This is, uh, uh, this book is, is a favorite of mine. I've said many times, I think this is the greatest work of fiction that C.S. Lewis ever wrote. Um, I'm a huge fan of the Narnia books. I love the Space Trilogy, especially Perelandra, which I think is his second best book ever. But um, Till We Have Faces is just an incredible, incredible book. And um, it is, I'm especially excited to talk about it because I think that too few C.S. Lewis fans read Till We Have Faces. Um, I know that I have talked to many C.S. Lewis fans um, who have started to read Till We Have Faces because it was C.S. Lewis, right? Um, but it didn't give them what they expected to find, like, at all. <laughs> Especially for the first stretch, right? Um, and so I, I, they stopped. Um, I, I've known a lot of people who had this experience with Till We Have Faces. It's not like Tolkien's Silmarillion, right? It's not like it's too hard to understand or something like that. It's just, as I say, not exactly what a lot of people expect. So anyway, I think this is, a, this is an incredible book. The thing that I would urge, uh, the main thing, the main kind of spoiler that I will give about Till We Have Faces is... Uh, you gotta, you gotta wait through to the end. Um, the payoff at the end of this book is the most spectacular that C.S. Lewis ever accomplished. Uh, so uh, that's just that's a it's a it's a huge thing, and I can't wait to get there. Um, uh, before we start, a couple quick announcements, because this week, in addition to beginning Till We Have Faces on the Mythgard Academy, we have another thing starting up that I wanted to make sure uh, to let you guys know about. Uh, and that is tomorrow night, Thursday night, on the 21st of September, uh, we're beginning our discussion of Season 7 of the Silmarillion Film Project, another Another broadcast has been going for quite some time. Um, season 7. So we're going to be building up in Season 7 to our theoretical adaptation of the Near Nith Arnoidiad. So, and if that doesn't sound like fun, what does, right? I, I just ask uh, that. But in any case, um, that's what we're, we're going to be beginning our conversations about tomorrow evening, same time. Uh, same time, same channel, tomorrow evening on the 21st, um, 10 p.m. Eastern Time on uh, the beginning of season season seven of the Silmarillion Film Project. And then this weekend, we have our first regional moot of the 2023-2024 year, academic year. Um, the fall moot season is now finally upon us. I'll be headed out to Portland, Oregon uh, for Cascade Moot, our first ever regional moot in the Pacific Northwest. I'm so excited. I've been looking forward to getting to the Pacific Northwest for some time um, and uh, can't wait to connect with folks up there. We've got a great group of people coming out there. If you can still, uh, if, you, if you're in the area and would like to drop by, there's still time. You could sign up for that. Um, you can also, of course, sign up to attend remotely. And um, yeah, it's going to be, it's, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty awesome. Um, uh, Tomas, any asks any reenactment plan? Um, I, I don't know. It depends on the weather. You know, we might do the crossing of the Midgewater Marshes. I'm not really sure, but um, um, we'll see. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Um, but um, in any case, I think it's going to, I, I, again, I'm so excited. It's always so much fun. Um, uh, you know, the only thing that's as much fun as, you know, uh, going to a new 
region to start a brand new regional moot is going back to the old ones and seeing old friends again. So we'll have some of those too. Of course, we've got two more coming up in October, Middle Moot in Iowa and New England Moot in New Hampshire, both in the month of October. And then we're going back to Denver for Mountain Moot in November and then down to New Orleans, another brand new moot location for Bayou Moot in the beginning of December. So, um, yeah, I don't know that the theme for Myth Moot next year has been finalized yet, Arthur, but I think that might be coming before two very... I've heard discussions, but I haven't heard anything definite on that yet. Um, yeah, yeah. So, anyway, it's... Um, it's it's excellent fun. Um, all right. So those are the exciting things that are coming up here within uh, this, not within a few weeks, this very week as is. So let's let's get into till we have faces here. I'm not going to give a whole lot of preamble. I just want to uh, the subtitle um, of this book is a myth retold. Um, and so. It's important, so we might as well acknowledge what C.S. Lewis has um, proclaimed from the beginning, right, in the title of his book, that what he's doing in this story, he is taking a traditional myth and he's retelling it, right? He's sort of recasting it. Um, this is not, he's not exactly doing what... Um, what Tolkien did, like he's not exactly doing mythography in the same way that Tolkien set out to do mythography in, say, the Book of Lost Tales, right at the beginning of his career. He's not exactly writing myth. That is to say, he's not trying to write a story like in the style and of the kind of traditional mythology. Tolkien set out to write mythology at the, you know, in the beginning. That's what the Book of Lost Tales is. Um, Tolkien's not exactly doing that. He is taking the story from a traditional myth, the myth of Cupid and Psyche, and he is digging into the story. Mighty Felix, it's a little bit more like Shakespeare does with King Lear. Yes, a little bit more like that. Um, except... <clears throat> okay, sorry, I'm just trying to, trying to figure out exactly how to, how to frame this. He is not, um, he's going to tell exactly the same story, but he's doing it as, you know, he's, he's taking a short story, you know, the, the, the version of, you know, the, the first written version we have of the story of Cupid and Psyche is Apuleius's, um, work, second century AD work called sometimes uh, the Metamorphosis and sometimes the Golden Ass. Um, that's the first written version we have of it. It's pretty obvious that the myth of Cupid and Psyche long predates that as there is uh, Greek art, uh, depictions of Cupid and Psyche in Greek art predating it by many centuries, which leads people to understand I mean, what certainly looks like the myth of Cupid and Psyche. And so therefore, it seems fairly certain that this myth significantly um, predated that. Um, but uh, again, the story is a short story. So he is he's adding a great deal. Right. He wants to bring us into this world um, and he is telling this. He chooses to tell the story from a very strong first person point of view. I say strong per first person because sometimes uh, when an author writes in first person, it's it's not a very intrusive first person. That is, well, you know, the person will use the first person pronouns and and, you know, we'll get a little bit of insight into what they're thinking. Right. You know, their own narration is very much sort of from their perspective. Right. And sometimes clever authors will play on that. Um, that is, they will uh, they will play on the limitations of the point of view of the of the first person narrator, right? Um, and you know, so what if so if you make the mistake of slipping into thinking that the narrator of the story is like an omniscient narrator, even though speaking in the first person, you'll get tricked sometimes. Like that kind of thing can happen in a first person narration sometimes. Um, I call this one a strong first-person narrator because it's hard to forget who's narrating it. You almost never lose sight 
of the voice and character of Orwal, um, who is our who is our narrator figure uh, in this story. Not only does not only do we always remember her that it's her and her point of view. Um, you know, she is not one of those first person narrators who's just kind of like describing what happens around her. She's a, she's her and her reactions and her impressions are very much center stage. And she has a very strong personality. Right. Um, in addition, she we are reminded frequently, well, often, I'll go with often. We're reminded often not only of who is narrating, but of the occasion of the narration. Um, again, think about other first-person narrations that you've read, right? Often, the first-person narrator will tell the story in a very sort of current way, like, uh, like they themselves, and they'll... Um, <laughs> Presumably, right, if the story is being told by this character who's going through all of the action, right, speaking in the first person, there's this, like, some kind of fictional understanding that at some point later that person must have written this down, right? I mean, like, that's that, that has to have happened, right, in order for the story to exist. And yet, you know... Sometimes the story won't really talk about that or it won't mention it very much. Right. And you're again, you're just kind of allowed to lose yourself in the the current and present narrative um, that is being told us by the by the primary storyteller. That's not this story either. Right. With Orwell, um, we are told that she told we'll, we'll look at that passage at the beginning. Needless to say, I am very interested in looking at the the sort of framing um passage at the beginning of the story, right? Um, clearly, we need to pay attention to that, and we'll get there in a moment. But she tells us that at the beginning of the story, as we'll see, that she's coming to the end of her life. So the occasion of her writing the story is the initial premise. And we're reminded of it throughout. We're reminded that these are memoirs of hers. That she is writing back and narrating, you know, from these these early events, we're going to be talking about um, my hope, if all goes well, as we'll get through chapters one through three today. We'll see how we do. Um, but um, uh, but anyway, we're we're gonna we're gonna be focusing on these uh, on the early chapters today, where she's talking about her childhood um, primarily. But it's exp it's not only has sort of the distance of recollection and retains that distance throughout, but Orwell, the narrator, is frequently interrupting the story with references to her later framework, right? Um, we know that she is queen of Gloam when she writes. Um, so this is, this is part one of the facts that we know from the very first page is that she is going to become the queen of Gloam. And we, we're reminded of this in moments like you may remember the time when she is commenting on her father's third, second marriage Third, I think second marriage. I think she and Redival, Orwell and Redival are, are full sisters. Um, so she um, she's commenting on the the king's second marriage and how and she does that political analysis, right? That her father thinks that he's made this great marriage because he's married the third daughter of the king of Kafad, but um, but then she editorializes it from the perspective of her own. Uh, uh, you know, ruling experience later on, right? And says that, like, you know, her father ha should have known um, that uh, uh, that the king of Kafad was a sinking man, right? The very fact that he agreed to marry his daughter uh, to her father was was proof of the fact that his, uh, you know, his stocks were dropping, right? Um, though the father had had no clue of this. So th there are several examples of. Um, of that kind of thing uh, that we see, where again we're we're not allowed to just kind of stay within, you know, just kind of immerse ourselves in the story and lose ourselves within the moment of the narrative. Um, there's a kind of a distance that's going to be kept, as we'll see, as we'll see throughout. So, um, so again, the the larger point, he is telling the story, he is unfolding the story within. Within you know in a novel form, right inside the, the 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 sort of the realistic psychological experience of a character, and he's putting it in the voice of a very strong 
a very strong voice of a very strong character, right? Um, now, of course, the setting, just to note the setting, um, he's also transported it, which is really interesting. Um, it's a Greek story. Um, it doesn't take place in ancient Greek. He displaces the story um, to somewhere east of Greece. We don't know exactly where, right? Some place sort of, I don't know, vaguely Mesopotamian, right? We don't really exactly know. There's a bunch of other little kingdoms. None of Greece is the only um, uh, sort of real world anchor that we have uh, geographically. We know the, the, the Greek lands, as they call them, are very far away. Uh, Time-wise, we don't know exactly when in history this is, though it seems to be pre-Alexander the Great um, on account of they're not speaking Greek, right? Their, their culture has not been... Um, uh, has not been made Greek in the way that cultures often were, right, in the post-Alexander the Great period. Um, but, um, uh, but in any case, it's, it's, so it's, it's removed from Greece, and so it's quite early, right? We're looking at, like, Bronze Age-ish uh, kind, of, uh, uh, kind of culture here, pre-Alexander the Great. Um, so, one of the things, one of the sort of elements that he introduces in this story from the beginning. He said he's going to retell this myth, right? And one of the very first things that we see in the first sentences of the story is that he's trans he's not just he's not just retelling it. He's transposing it. And he's transposing it not by bringing it forward into the modern world, say, which would be a very common way uh, to tell this story. Of course, many of you are familiar. In fact, I bet you almost all of you are familiar with another retelling of the myth of Cupid and Psyche. Um, it's been retold many times before, and most of you probably know one of those retellings, and it is very much a retelling in which the story of Cupid and Psyche was moved forward into the modern era, or at least what was modern at the time that the story is written. And of course, I'm talking about Beauty and the Beast. Um, uh, Beauty and the Beast is, well, okay, it's not 100% the same story, but it's pretty much a retelling of the Cupid and Psyche story. Um, and uh, with some very interesting differences as well. And there will be interesting differences in this one too, as we will see. Um, but... Um, uh, but yeah, Sphinx, uh, sorry, I'm, uh, Sphinx says that transposition uh, makes him think of music. Um, yeah, I'm actually, right, uh, Curious Chance was, uh, is uh, referring to C.S. Lewis's essay on transposition, um, or, or I think it's just called transposition, I think. But anyway, yes, I was thinking of that essay too, uh, Curious Chance, which is why I use that metaphor. Um, it's a phenomenal essay. I, I keep calling Till We Have Faces the greatest work of fiction that C.S. Lewis ever wrote. I think his essay, Transposition, might be the greatest work of nonfiction he ever wrote, actually. Um, so glad you raised that one. Uh, and that's why it was in my mind. Um, uh, it's incredible. Anyway, so Sphinx, it's uh, one of the things that he, he he compares, for instance, translation from one language to another to transposition, um, to transpose music from, uh, especially from something like to transpose a symphony, um, an orchestral score of a symphony, uh, and transpose it for like the piano, for instance. Um, but um, Oh, I don't remember which volume Transposition was published in. The Weight of Glory is very good, too, Brick Tales. I like that a lot. But Transposition, oh, man. Um, I, I, I have the... Um, uh, it was a good day for me when Audible released the complete essays of C.S. Lewis unabridged uh, in audiobook form. It was phenomenal. <laughs> so anyway, but that means I often forget uh, which collection it was originally published in. Um, but um, anyway, it's just it's a, it's just completely brilliant. But anyhow, um, so he has transposed this. Uh, he's shifted it from Greek culture to a different culture, but it remembers Greece. 
And in fact, the connection between the Greek world and the world of Gloam is one of the running stories of this whole thing, right? So he he's not just merely detaching it, not just like saying, okay, forget Greece, I'm going to do a totally new version of that. Um, he wants us to remember Greece. He wants us to remember the Greek connection, but he, but by shifting it, he introduces this other element, right? He, he makes it more other, or rather he tells us, um, he, he tells us this story from the point of view of the other. And it's really fascinating. I think it's, it's, a, it's a really fascinating effect because through the eyes of Orwell, who understands Greek stories because of her tutor, um, does not really, like, they're not native to her, right? They are alien to her um, and to her own culture. Uh, and we, as modern readers, find both her and the Greek culture sort of alien, right? So we're, we're kind of with Orwell both looking at the Greek myth from this sort of uh, distance, which I think is interesting. Um, so that's one, but he also displaces it in time. He pushes it further back. Um, wherever exactly Orwell, Queen of Gloam, is in history, it is presumably prior to, um, and you know, the, again, the earliest written account that we have, uh, surviving written account anyway, um, of the story of Cupid and Psyche is from, I think, what, 165 or something like that? Um, so it's, you know, again, like AD, again, or, you know, BCE, or sorry, CE. It's, it's, it's late. Um, he's pushing this story back centuries and centuries before that, at least to the times um, that, you know, near the very beginning of where there's any evidence uh, for this story being in circulation. The effect, one of the effects, I think, is to give us a sense that we're we're kind of getting to the root of the thing, right? Um, one of the things that this story is going to be very interested in is this is how myths, how, like what is the true story behind myths? What is the relationship between myth and history, between myth and fact? Um, that's the his his various transpositions, transposition in genre, transposition in time, transposition in location, um, are all going to kind of put pressure on that. And we'll be kind of seeing that um, developed as we go. Um, okay. Um, enough preamble. Let's, uh, let's get into the story and look at the, just the regular amble um, and how... Um, and how we yes the transposition of point of view very important Sharon I agree that's a uh, that's a that's a a big deal and again a, a, an especially important deal uh, in uh, uh, in the case of in the case of this story okay oh footnote um, at the end of the book in like an epilogue to the book C S Lewis does his own sort of commentary and discussion, um, talks about the myth, uh, some of the things that he was doing, points out some of what he thought uh, were some of the most interesting differences there. We'll read that and talk about it later. We're not going to start with that, right? I think C.S. Lewis was very wise to put that at the end of the book. Um, it's not like it's exactly a spoiler, but if you haven't read it, I would encourage you not to yet uh, until we get through to the end. Um uh, okay, all right, let's, uh, let's dig into it. Here's the start. I am old now and have not much to fear from the anger of the gods. I have no husband nor child, nor hardly a friend, through whom they can hurt me. My body, this lean carrion that still has to be washed and fed and have clothes hung about it daily with so many changes, they may kill as soon as they please. The succession is provided for. My crown passes to my nephew. Being, for all these reasons, free from fear, I will write in this book what no one who has happiness would dare to write. I will accuse the gods, especially the god who lives on the Grey Mountain. That is, I will tell all he has done to me from the very beginning, as if I were making my complaint of him before a judge. But there is no judge between gods and men, and the god of the mountain will not answer me. 
terrors and plagues are not an answer. I write in Greek as my old master taught it to me. It may some day happen that a traveler from the Greek lands will again lodge in this place and read the book. Then he will talk of it among the Greeks, where there is great freedom of speech, even about the gods themselves. Perhaps their wise men will know whether my complaint is right, or whether the god could have defended himself if he had made an answer. Okay. We learn a lot. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Kirsten says, I, I read that with feeling. I... The Orwell's character kind of sweeps you away, right? As I said, it's a very strong voice. Um, I can barely think of another first-person novel that has a, a stronger voice of a narrator um, than. I, I'm not saying it's unique, but I'm, I'm saying it's 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 on the extreme end of the spectrum when it comes to the strength of the voice of. Um, of the of the main character, um, okay. So, Emma, yeah, that's one of the things that really I think jumps out at you right away. Um, her relationship with the gods. She is angry, right? You can see her. She talks about the anger of the gods and expresses her anger at the gods. But there is no question, Emily. So Emily's question was: Does Orwell still believe in the gods? It's one of the things that is most clear and I think most important to, to, to hear from the beginning in this frame. There isn't a single moment that I see in this narrative in which that question, do you believe in the gods, um, is even relevant to Orwell. The question of, a question of faith, do you think the gods exist or not, it's not even, that doesn't even seem relevant. Uh, to this story. Orwell has no doubts. At no point does she have any doubts. Orwell knows what's true. The gods are a fact. They're an uncomfortable fact to her at the best of times. And from the sound of the tone of these first two paragraphs, this is not the best of times. <laughs> right? Um, she... So yes, like we, the, the, the question, you know, the, um, the trajectory in which one says, uh, the world seems cruel and arbitrary. And so I don't believe in the, the gods anymore. Right. That's uh, how a modern person might respond. Um, this is not how Orwell responds. That doesn't even, it's not even obvious to me, um, that that's on her radar screen. Like, that that's even sort of an option in that sense, if you see what I mean. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just not on the table. Are the gods good? Well, not sure that's much of a question for her, too. Just not because she doesn't think of it, but because she believes she knows the answer. Right? Um, notice what she complains of. There is no judge between gods and men, and the god of the mountain will not answer me. And then that stinging terrors and plagues are not an answer. Jerk. <laughs> right? I mean, like, okay, so yeah, the gods can send terrors and plagues. Yeah, yeah, they can do that. Right? But that isn't an answer. I want, I'm going to stand and make my complaint. Right? Um, yeah, yeah. Leafa Starlight, you're right. She says, I find it interesting that the idea of fearfulness of the gods is a worldly fear that she has almost escaped, instead of a fear of post-death punishment. Very different from a modern monotheistic perspective. Absolutely. Absolutely. She, she says she has nothing to fear. She has not much to fear from the anger of the gods. And then she lists the causes for her lack of fear. I... But, there's nothing they can take from me. I've got no husband, no child, hardly a friend, through whom they can hurt me. Right? They can send terrors and plagues. They control the world. She see, that, That's apparently a given to her. Right? They could still kill her. She's alive. But she's old, and she doesn't think much of herself, at least of her body. This lean carrion that still has to be washed and fed and have clothes hung about it daily. Um... 
they can kill that as soon as they please, she says. I don't care. This is why, she says, I need to have no fear of the anger of the gods. Um, so Leaf of Starlight is exactly correct. Um, that um, is exactly correct that she's not thinking. Now, we'll come back to this. She, at least in her memories of her earlier childhood, she will talk about fear of death. But here when she is writing of herself as an old woman who expects to die soon. Um, one of the things, little spoiler, um, mini spoiler, we will get later, we'll catch up to like the modern day when she's writing this later on. Um, she's going back and telling the story of her life and this whole history in order to get up to, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a reason this, there was a, a triggering event that started her writing this book, that starting her, her started her writing her complaint um, as if before a judge. Um, and we'll get eventually at the end of book one, um, which is about three quarters of the book, um, we'll get up to the to that triggering event, right up to the sort of modern day with aged Queen Orwell here at the end. Um, uh, but of course, again, that's only book one, that book two shifts. But yes, she has nothing left to lose. So in, in, in her recollections of her earlier life, we'll see her talking and thinking about the fear of death. But when she comes here at the end, she concedes that the gods are rulers of the world and can do what they please in the world. And that and notice that she implies not only in her first paragraph there about the things that, you know, when gods get angry at you, the kind of stuff they do to you, right? Like kill your family and kill your friends and, you know, punish your body and all that kind of thing, right? So it's clear that she believes not only that they can do those things, but they're quite likely to do those things. And then again, there's that crack about terrors and plagues, right? Very much within their power and totally the kind of thing they would do, right? It seems, uh, according to her. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. So Sharon, I agree that you are right. What we, um, notice her, sh her, that her shift, um, well, actually, hang on, before we get to her shift, um, she talks specifically about the, the God who lives on the gray mountains. I will accuse the gods, she says. Um, I will accuse the gods, especially the God who lives on the gray mountain. I will tell all he has done to me from the very beginning as if I were making my complaint before a judge. We must remember this. We must remember that what we are getting in this story, this is not like an autobiography. This is not Orwell's autobiography. This is a very, she is announcing here at the beginning the fact that her memoir, her recollections are purposeful. There's, there is a specific thread that she is emphasizing about her life. This is not the autobiography of Queen Orwell of Gloom. That will become more and more obvious as we get towards... I mean, it, it's going to turn out... This, isn't, this doesn't even count as a spoiler because it doesn't even really matter much for the story. That she's a great queen. Of Gloom. She, you know, by the time of her death, Queen Orwell of Gloom is going to be a legendary figure, one of the greatest rulers that this country um, or any of the countries round about has ever seen. And when she gets to that part of the story, she's going to skip it all. <laughs> right? She's just going to be like, yeah, whatever. Then a bunch of non important things happened. Um, so it's not an autobiography. Um, she has a particular axe to grind. There is a purpose for which she is recalling and retelling all of the things that she is recalling and telling. And this, she says, is what it is. So we have to remember when we go back and we read through the narrative, we go back, we're going forward, she's going back, um, that what she is doing is telling all that the God who lives on the Grey Mountain has done to her from the very beginning. She is making her complaint. But then notice she she says she says a couple things about this. First of all, um, it's um, she brags a little bit about the fact that she's going to do something almost nobody would dare to do, and that is accuse the gods. Why would nobody do this? Why does nobody do this? Out of all reverence, respect, love, nah, 
Fear is why. Fear. Um, I will write in this book what no one who has happiness would dare to write. Because if you're happy, you've got stuff the gods can take away from you. And if you step out of line, if you accuse the gods, if you speak up about the horrible thing, the horrible things the gods do to people, they will take your happiness away. That's just what they're like. I mean, this, this is clearly the frame that we're getting there, right? Her attitude is really clear. And then there's that sentence in the middle of the, that paragraph. But there is no judge between gods and men, and the god of the mountain will not answer me. I know this is pointless. I'm going to write this as if I'm making my complaint before a judge. Um, but it doesn't matter, right? She wants to do it. She's determined to do it. Even though she thinks there's no point. Um, and it sort of can't do any good. But she won't be silent. She is too angry to be silent. The god of the mountain will not answer me. Nobody can actually hold the gods accountable. Look at her stated intention. There is a purpose. What does she hope from her book? It's not just a rant, right? Um, she, I write in Greek. It may someday happen that a traveler from the Greek lands will again lodge in this place and read the book. Then he will talk of it among the Greeks, where there is great freedom of speech about even the gods themselves. Perhaps their wise men will know whether my complaint is right or whether the god could have defended himself if he had made an answer. There's, well, at least, um, at least a grain of generosity in that last sentence. That she does seem to consider it at least what um, conceivable, right? That um, the God, if the God had deigned to make an answer to her complaint, that he could have defended himself, right? Probably, I mean, you know, probably not, but, um, but she does refer the question to learned people. Some of those learned Greeks Maybe their wise men will know whether my complaint is right. So there is a, a sort of tribunal that maybe others, more learned, maybe somewhere in a great freedom, in a place where there is great freedom of speech about even the gods themselves, maybe someday people will read the book. There's a kind of bridge towards us here, there, right? A kind of invitation. Uh, a, an almost explicit invitation from Orwell to us, the readers, because although we might not be ancient Greeks, we are strange people from a distant land and time whose language is not her own, but who can read what she says, um, who might be able to sit and judge. Again, she issues the invitation. Judge my complaint. Am I right in my accusation of the gods? There's, there's, there's that implicit question that she begins here. She does leave that open. She's not, she's angry. There are many things that she seems not to question. Many things that she asserts with such force that it seems there's no doubting it. Like the reality of the gods and the cruelty of the gods. Um, but she, um, but she leaves open the question, it seems. Genuinely, on some level. Am I right or am I wrong? You judge me. I'm going to put it all out there without reserve. And you tell me, am I right or wrong? Am I right to be angry at the God? Could the God have defended himself if he had made an answer? Um, Maureen, you're right that it's funny that a queen sees more freedom in another land and language. Absolutely. That's a, a reality of her world, as she'll make perfectly clear. It doesn't matter that she's the queen. 
Right? I mean, as the queen, she has more freedom than many, but she's not free of Ungat. Right? This That's the whole premise here. Right? She's a queen, but look what being a queen is. What is being a queen get her? No husband, nor child, nor hardly a friend. My body, this lean carrion. Right? That's her queenly experience right here. Right? She doesn't say or harp on the fact that um, she uh, is miserable, right? I mean, she doesn't talk here at great length about like, oh, I, my life is horrible and I hate my life and wish to die. But we can hear it. We can feel it. I will write in this book what no one who has happiness would dare to write, right? We can, we can feel both her misery and her anger here. Um, and we'll see, Maureen, as we read through, um, first in her observations of her father and her father's relationship to Ungit and the priest of Ungit, and then in her own dealings, uh, we will see the uh, extent to which she very much does not believe that she is free. Um, yeah. By the way, thank you. I know many of you who are here discussing this uh, live have uh, read this book before, uh, and um, I appreciate the restraint that many of you have already been showing um, in avoiding spoilers. I normally am not. Um, uh, I'm normally not very protective of spoilers. I've often said things like, "If a book can be ruined by finding out what happens later on, it couldn't have been a very good story." Um, but um, uh, and that's and that's true. What I um, think is important here, though, is the reason I, I, I think some some element of that is important here is just because I th we don't want to lose sight of what of how the story unfolds, because this story, the way that this story works and the effect of this story. Um, to give a little spoiler of my own. Ultimately, the drama of this story is Orwell's own understanding of things, um, her own internal change. And we're not going to get that. We're not going to see it. We're not going to really appreciate it if we try to jump to the end. Um, it's really important to stick with Orwell as she as she goes through. Um, exactly, J.J., that's exactly right. It's not that knowing the end spoils it, but rather that we don't want to be thinking of the ending right now. I will admit that there will be passages that I'm going to stop and emphasize as we go through, which I certainly wouldn't, which wouldn't be jumping out to me as very significant if I hadn't already read the ending, right? Um, to that extent, I'm going to um, cheat. Well, help help or cheat, you know, depending on your point of view. Um, you know, normally you have to read a book two, three times to get that, you know, that kind of experience, right? To, to, to perceive anew. Um, I'm going to try to highlight them as we go. Um, there'll be a bunch of passages, therefore, that I'm going to read and talk about, point out a couple things about them, and then just say, this will be important later and kind of move on, right? Um, but uh, yeah, Cal Elro says this is one of the most important books to read twice that I know of. Yeah, agreed. Despite the fact that I'm going to point out for you a bunch of things you probably wouldn't notice until your second or third reading. Um, I, again, just because there's no way for you to suspect that they would be important until after you've gotten to the ending. Um, you will still probably want to read it a second or third time, I would think. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. So, um, okay. Um, all right, let's keep going. Um, by the way, <laughs> one last footnote on this passage. Um, see why a lot of C.S. Lewis fans don't get through this book, <laughs> right? I mean, I can't even, uh, like my own family, I don't, I, you know, my parents, um, introduced me to the, I mean, to, to, to Lewis and indirectly to Tolkien, um, by reading me the Chronicles of Narnia when I was seven. They love C.S. Lewis. They love the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, I, they just, they, they just can't get enough of that. Um, they, I don't think anyone 
in my family has finished reading Do We Have Faces. Like, I, a lot of C.S. Lewis fans that I know get to this opening and are like, what on earth is this? You know, like, what kind of, like, blasphemous, <laughs> pagan, atheistical story is this? Right? Uh, and it's just, you gotta, you gotta just, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta let it play out. You gotta let it play out. Um, but, um, yeah, Ambrose just... Uh, Aureliana says it's interesting to describe this book to fans of Lewis. It is. It is. It can be kind of a hard sell. Um, it, it can be kind of a hard sell. Yeah, to, to, to folks who don't know about it. Absolutely. Um, oh, this is written well after. Emily, this is one of the last, um, his last works of fiction. Um, the dedication is to Joy Davidman, uh, whom he marries uh, in his advanced years. Um, um, but yeah, yeah, it's um, it's very... Uh, it's very late uh, in his life. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, 1956, thank you. Yeah, within a year of his death. Um, uh, or sorry, not a year, a decade is what I was thinking. Within a decade of his death. Um, yeah, thank you, JJ, for the year. I'd forgotten the year. I'm, uh, I'm, I tend to be sloppy that way. Okay, let's keep going. She's describing her town you know, the main city of Glom. About as far beyond the ford of the Shennet, that is the, the, the river that flows through the city, about as far beyond the ford of the Shennet as our city is on this side of it, you come to the holy house of Ungit. And beyond the house of Ungit, going all the time east and north, you come quickly to the foothills of the Grey Mountain. The god of the Grey Mountain, who hates me, is the son of Ungit. He does not, however, live in the house of Ungit. But Ungit sits there alone, in the furthest recess of her house where she sits. It is so dark that you cannot see her well. But in summer, enough light may come down from the smoke holes in the roof to show her a little. She is a black stone without head or hands or face, and a very strong goddess. My old master, whom we called the fox, said she was the same whom the Greeks call Aphrodite. But I write all the names of people and places in our own language. Oh man, Lisa Starlight, I agree. The God of the Grey Mountain who hates me is a really great line. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> yes, Yero, I agree. One of the things, um, the striking contrast for me, I find, so the Greek goddess Aphrodite, um, whose Latin name, right, whose Roman name is Venus, um, the, the Greek name in particular, the word Venus is colored a little bit, at least for me, in my associations, both by the way that the word is used in modern, probably that is the connection to things like venereal disease and stuff um, in the modern era. Um, but also just Venus, just the word Venus was used um, in throughout the Middle Ages <clears throat> almost as a synonym for sex. Um, Venus was associated so, I, I don't know, Again, especially through the through the medieval period, I, I don't speak to Roman reverence exactly and and, and Roman traditions, um, but um, uh, but anyway, Venus has you know comes over time. Uh, the Roman goddess Venus comes over time to be associated so uh, so much with sex and sexual desire. Um, for instance, the most common euphemism for sex. Uh, in medieval treatises is the act of Venus. That's what they called it. Um, um, so, anyway, the Greek name, Aphrodite, always uh, sort of sounds to me more more innocent, associated not just... I mean, there's still sex involved, right? But, um, but more, with, more with beauty, innocence, desire. Um... Such that I find the juxtaposition of everything associated with 
the goddess the Greeks call Aphrodite on the one hand, with the black stone without head or hands or face. That is Ungit on the other side. Um, it's a very strong um, context. Maureen, thank you for noticing that. Very, very good. Um, Ungit has no face. That gets slipped in there in the middle of the sentence, right? Um, we have no clear idea the significance of the title of this book. Um, sorry. I got a little choked up thinking about the title of this book <laughs> later on in the story. But yes, um, I think it is very, very well noticed that the very first character in this story who is described as having no face is the goddess Ungit, the black stone, a very strong goddess. Um, and yes, curious chance, the, the name, the sound of the name Ungit tells you something. Um, I think, I think the name Ungit, um, the name Ungit for the goddess in this book, it's one of my favorite namings. Like, I, I don't know of anywhere where the, the sound and feel and texture of the name of a figure in a book fits more perfectly with the thing, right? I just love the name Ungit. Um, the way in which the kind of harshness of it, it's not just like that the whole language is harsh. I mean, Orwal and Redival and, uh, you know, many of the other names that we get. Um, you know, Tarin, uh, the name of the uh, poor young lad who uh, is caught kissing Redival and immediately castrated. Um, I, I mean, lots of other people that we meet. No, nobody else has names like that. It's not, so it's, it's not just like the language, right? Um, the way that the, um, uh, the, the hard G at the middle, um, the really unpleasant sound of the of the syllable git at the end right the way that the ng combination in the middle makes you kind of swallow the word right uh and then hit the g like a like a like a like a golem-esque gurgle in the middle um it's um yeah and it sounds very old yes i agree i agree um yeah yeah um and it does. It, it 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 it's kind of like the word ingot. I agree. Um, and she looks like an ingot, as well, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So notice um, notice a, a couple other things here. What is the goddess? Who is the goddess? I think this is something that Lewis captures really, really interestingly. Um, I think when most modern readers read stories about statues of gods in ancient temples, um, I think that they, I don't know. Lewis certainly seems to be suggesting that there's a very different kind of relationship there, a different kind of conceptualization um, that than what we might expect, right? Um, we'll get a little bit more on this later on, m much later on, admittedly, but um, the stone, the stone that's in the temple, it's not just a, it's not a representation of the goddess. It's not a statue. It's just a stone. It is the goddess. She is a black stone and a very strong goddess, Orwell tells us. Does that mean they just worship a rock? Well, no, she has powers. Um, and she is other things, but it's, it's, the goddess is more than just the rock, but yet the rock is the goddess. 
Um, and the way in which those things are not even like we're not even invited to consider them. Um, you know, Orwell, the way she talks about it, she's not going to tell you like, no. So the the rock isn't actually the goddess herself. Right. It's, uh, you know, there, there are lots of ways in which we can theorize about it. She's not theorizing about it. That's one of the things I think is important here. We'll, um, um, we'll come back to this because the story will come back to this later on. Um, I just wanted to kind of point it out a little bit here. Um, now, what is the connection between the black stone without head, hands, or face and the Greek goddess Aphrodite? We don't know that we have the authority of her old master, her old tutor, the fox, um, who was Greek and quite learned, um, that she is. He identifies Ungit with Aphrodite. Um, so we'll come to see that later on. Um, we'll, we'll get a little bit more explanation here. Um, but she's going to emphasize she's not translating it. So notice what she, she's refusing to transpose. She's not going to call the goddess Aphrodite. The fox says she's the same whom the Greeks call Aphrodite. But she's Ungit. And she has no face. Um... Notice what is associated. How we're... It, it isn't just the the idol. It's just the stone itself. It's the house as well. The house of Ungit. The house of Ungit is dark. In summer, enough light may come down from the smoke holes in the roof to show her a little. Right? That is... Um, so we get smoke holes. So we've got fires burning, sacrifices probably. Um, the stone, the black stone, is it actually used as an altar? What kinds of sacrifices are done? We're not, we're not told yet, right? Um, Bricktails, that's another really great question that it doesn't seem that Orwell has a particular opinion about. Is Ungit a local goddess or a universal goddess? Ungit is a local goddess. I mean, the rock's right over there. You don't get more local than a big black stone, right? She's very local. Um, she didn't even... They didn't even import the stone, right? The stone came up out of the ground, so she's very local, right? Yet at the same time, she's like, yeah, the fox says she's Aphrodite. Seems fair, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, right, exactly with Starlight. Yet she is. She is Aphrodite. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Orwell doesn't seem to question that. She accepts the identification. Which would imply that, yeah, the Greeks know her too. So she's not merely local. But that doesn't seem to phase Orwell. She doesn't that's not how she thinks. That's not her concern. Um, unless it gives her the one sliver of hope that she has in the introduction, right? If it's true that they know something of Ungit, whom they call Aphrodite, in the Greek lands as well, where they have great freedom of speech even about the gods, maybe they can tell me if my complaint against the gods is justified, right? Um, so there's a sort of a sliver of hope in that hint of universality in the goddess Ungit. Um, but that doesn't stop her from talking about and still plainly considering Ungit a, uh, a very local deity indeed. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Cal Elros, fantastic question. If she's Aphrodite but possesses none of the traits of Aphrodite, what does it mean to say they're the same? Yeah, exactly. An excellent question, right? What is the essence? What is, what is Ungit? Who is Ungit really? What do the stories boil down to? When you take the Glomian traditions, I don't know what the adjectival form of Glom is, but I'm going with Glomian 
at this point. What is the 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 what are the Glomian traditions of Ungit and what are the Greek traditions of Aphrodite? What do they have in common? Who is this person, right? Um, yeah, yeah, Glomic. Ah, Glomic is okay. Um, yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> Glomerous. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, Glomish. Okay. No, you're right. I'll go with Glomish. I like it because it's like Gnomish. Um, <laughs> Glomish. All right. I'm going with Glomish. Glomish is funnier. Um, Glomish is funnier, so I'll go with that. Um, oh, Gloming. <laughs> uh, that's pretty good, Sharon. In, in the Gloming. I don't know. It's a little too overtly Tolkien. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> anyway, okay. I'll go. I'll go with Glomish. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so, the god of the gray mountain is the son of Ungit. Footnote: This is one of the reasons why I did not begin by reviewing by talking about Cupid. It's myth of Cupid and Psyche is the myth that we're retelling here. Or, I mean, that Lewis is retelling and that we're rediscussing. Um, I, almost everything you know about Cupid, especially visually, is horribly inappropriate. Um, just saying. <laughs> so, well, I... Knowledge of the Greek stuff is important because it's it's going to be playing on the surface of things. And I think we are being very much invited to ask the question that Cal Elros was talking about. Right? I mean, we're just told right here from the very beginning when we're first introduced to Ungit, we're told, P.S., she's Aphrodite, actually. Right? With no justification with no explanation. And if we're kind of looking out the corner of our eyes at the, at the rock, at the black stone and saying, uh, really? You're, uh, you're sure? Sure. That's Aphrodite. Okay. Right. I, I'm not, I'm not seeing it. Right. I mean, if that's our reaction, that's not, um, that's not inappropriate. Right. Um, th that seems to be, uh, that's part of the play. I think that Lewis is doing here again, we're sort of playing on the Greek traditions, recalling the Greek traditions, you know, through the, with the help of the Fox, the Greek tutor, um, the Greek stuff is going to be overlaid over Orwell's native Glomish experience. Um, but we're, um, um, but yet we're going to be continuously invited to hold the beautiful, um, you know, the beautiful, desirable, loving and lovely, almost like innocent and yet sexual um, concept of the goddess Aphrodite, um, you know, that lies, you know, we're, we're going to be asked to juxtapose that with this glum, dark, um, faceless, shapeless rock that sits in this dark building through which light barely on the brightest days of the year successfully filters down through the smoke holes. Um, that's a tension that Lewis seems to be cultivating here. Um, yeah, okay. Let's keep going. So this is uh, when the fox is um, being discovered, when she comes in and meets the fox for the first time. Now, Greekling, said my father to this man, I trust to beget a prince one of these days, and I have a mind to see him brought up in all the wisdom of your people. Meanwhile, practice on them, he pointed to us. He pointed at us children. If a man can teach a girl, he can teach anything. Then, just before he sent us away, he said, Especially the elder, see if you can make her wise. It's about all she'll ever be good for. I didn't understand that, but I knew it was like things I had heard people say of me ever since I could remember. I loved the fox, as my father called him, better than anyone I had yet known. Um, so, a couple things here. One of the realities 
that she tracks, right? One of the things, it's not a major theme through the story, right? Um, that is, she doesn't emphasize it a whole lot, but we get several really important references, not only to the fact that Oroa is extremely ugly, but to when she came to understand that she was ugly. Um, curious chance, why does it take her a long time to understand her ugliness? Well, they don't have mirrors in Globe. She's never seen her own face. Um, so she um, she doesn't know what she looks like. Um, and um, anyway, she... This is important. Notice, remember, we get one of the very... No, not one of. The very first scene that she... The very first scene that she describes was the scene where she and Redival are having their hair cut, right? They have to, they have to be shorn um, out of mourning for their mother when their mother dies. And there's all of the comments about the, the golden curls, right, of Redival uh, as they're being shorn off and nobody, you know, everyone talking about what a shame it is to see the, all the gold coming off and um, look at her beautiful curls. And nobody said anything like that about Orowal when she was being shorn prior to that, right? Nobody was making any big deal of it. Um, she doesn't say it. Um, she doesn't say it explicitly. But you get the... You, I get the sense, in any case. This is one of the first things she accuses the gods of. She was a girl born without beauty, aggressively without beauty, who had none of the one characteristic for which girls in her culture were primarily valued. This explicit by her father right here, right? Her father is the voice of her culture, the determining element of her culture, really, as the king and her father, right? Um, a girl who is as ugly as Orwa is good for nothing. Maybe if she can be made wise, she'll be good for something. But if she can't, she will be good for absolutely nothing. And I know it's one of the things that I think Lewis does an amazing job at throughout this text, throughout this whole story, is immersing us in the imagined culture of this ancient place, right? And he does so unapologetically from the perspective of someone who takes all of it for granted. Um, Orwell is not a feminist, right? Orwell's not making arguments here that girls are not just to be pretty faces to look at, right? Even if a girl doesn't have beauty, she ha this, this is not relevant. It's not relevant in this culture. Um, her father is very is very clear um, about her value and how her value is how low her value is as a human being because she's A, a girl and B, ugly. We know when Istra is going to be born the plague that her father, the king, feels that all of these useless girls are to him. He needs an heir. Uh, and to have girl after girl after girl, he's being, he's being plagued with them, right? So, again, this is something that's a challenge in this book. Lewis does such a good job, I think, with through the voice of this very strong first-person narrator, immersing us in the the culture and point of view of this story, um, that it can be really jarring to modern people. I think, again, he does it really, really well. Um, this is one way. Another is, of course, the attitude towards slavery, right? Um, you know, there's, there's, there's... 
you know, he's sympathetic to the plight of slaves. The fox is a slave and the fox is very aware of, you know, he cares about his freedom. He, you know, laments the fact that he is a slave. Nobody enjoys being a slave. Right. Um, but there's no question of like slavery itself being evil. Right? We're not going to we're not going to go in there. Right. Because they weren't going there in this culture. Um, there might be two opinions on how you treat slaves, right? Or what you do with slaves or that kind of thing. Um, but he enters into the framework of the society. Like slavery is a fact, a cultural fact of this entire region. Um, but um, anyway, yeah, it's, uh, it is, Sharon, I do think it's uncomfortable. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's uncomfortable um, and pretty, um, pretty uncompromising in that way, in a lot of ways. But but I would urge us to look at this because as uh, as uncomfortable as it might be, it's crucial to the story. Orwell's ugliness is very important. And remember, she's not just telling her autobiography. She's not just telling us about her ugliness and recalling these moments. Um, I didn't understand that, but I knew it was like things I had heard people say of me ever since I could remember. Why is she telling us this? She has a reason why she's telling us this whole story, right? She is making her complaint against the gods. And this is one of the places where her complaint begins. She will come at the end, near the end of this chapter, to recall the moment, the very moment, when she first knew for certain that she was ugly. Um, the, this realization and where it places her, how it comes to help define her world and her place in the world. This is a major element of this story. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, but notice the second thing. It's the transition. I, of course, I only quoted the first sentence of the next paragraph, but it's that transition that I find so important. Um, we go from confronting, almost confronting, not quite yet fully confronting, this cornerstone of Orwell's reality, this critical thing which, um, which so deeply informs her whole life experience, her own sense of her her own perception of her ugliness. And then the immediate transition. I loved the fox, as my father called him, better than anyone I had yet known. This moment when she is almost fully confronted with the reality of her ugliness and therefore, certainly in her father's eyes, uselessness, um, is also the moment when she makes her best friend when the person who will change her life the first person who will change her life comes into it yeah uh, curious chance you're right I love that I loved the fox comma as my father called him right and yet you can read it fast as I loved the fox as my father right yes um, at this very moment when her actual father is uh, cruelly dismissing her. Her true father, her spiritual father, right? Um, the one that she loves. She doesn't call him father. She calls him grandfather, right? Um, uh, but the one who really has that role in her life. Um, one of the greatest, most positive influences on her entire life um, is introduced to at this exact moment. It's th that introduction is juxtaposed with this moment of her realization. How old is she here, Scott? It's not clear. Um, I think she's quite young. I mean, my sense is probably five, six, something like that. I mean, she's she's quite young. Um, yeah, Mighty Felix is right. Uh, he does call her daughter. Yeah, yeah. Um, my, yeah, my, my guess is that she is very young. Um, definitely elementary school age, 
I would say, in American terms. Um, yeah, she'll call him grandfather, but he does call her daughter all the time. That's well-remembered, Mighty Felix. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Um, oh, April, that's a really interesting point. April says, uh, in the framework of her complaint... Um, the framework of her complaint bodes ill for the fox. If she loves him, he must not have a happy ending. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. At least he's almost certainly dead by the time uh, she writes the book, right? That's that's clear. I mean, she would never have said that she has no friends left if the fox were still alive, right? Um, but then again, we're also told that she's quite old by then, so um, we don't know for sure what might have happened to him. Um, yeah, but... Um, uh, I think we are going to find out the fox's name, but I always forget it. We'll see. It might come up, but it's not crucial. The fox is uh, what he shall be known as through almost the entire story. Um, okay, let's keep going. So she she learns from the fox and she teaches the fox. She helps the fox to understand about the culture and traditions of Gloom, right? That was how I came to tell him all about Ungit, about the girls who are kept in her house and the presents that brides have to make to her and how we sometimes in a bad year have to cut someone's throat and pour the blood over her. He shuddered when I said that and muttered something under his breath. But a moment later he said, yes, she is undoubtedly Aphrodite, though more like the Babylonian than the Greek. But come, I'll tell you a tale of our Aphrodite. Um, just pause for a second. Um, this is one of this is almost as much as we're going to be given about why why the Greek identify why the Greek why the fox identifies her, um, Ungit that is with the Greek Aphrodite. Um, she's clearly and explicitly a, a fertility goddess. Um, the girls who are kept in her house, there are temple prostitutes in the house of Ungit. Um, so there are, there are girls in the house of Ungit who men go and have sex with in the temple. Um, that's a thing, right? So temple prostitution. Um, brides have to make presents to Ungit for fertility, and it, you know, to, to, to um, propitiate her, uh, to have her grant them fertility. Um, she's not only connected with the fertil with human fertility, with that is with the conception of human children, um, but she's also apparently connected with the fertility of the entire land. If it's a bad year, by which I understand the crops are bad, maybe the the herds are not breeding uh, properly. Um, uh, you you would have to placate. That that suggests that Ungit is angry at the entire land, right? And needs to be placated with the blood of a human. So they will do occasional human sacrifices uh, in order to placate um, Ungit. The fox does not approve. He shudders and mutters something under his breath. Um, she's more like the Babylonian Aphrodite than the Greek, he says, but undoubtedly Aphrodite. So, um, the mere fact that she is a fertility goddess seems to be the primary thing that leads the fox to identify Ungut with Aphrodite. He clearly has this idea of a universal divine concept or element or figure. There is this idea of Aphrodite. Um, and there are, there are Greek stories Greek stories and traditions about Aphrodite. There's a Babylonian figure who is like Aphrodite, right? Whom he identifies with Aphrodite. And then locally there's Ungit, right? And presumably there are dozens of others as well. But the, but, um, the fox seems to believe in some kind of higher thing which all of these local stories point to. Um, But now he's going to tell a story. So having been told a little, a few sordid details, which he clearly, the fox clearly finds sordid, um, about Ungit, um, he's going to tell a story of Aphrodite. So he begins telling the story of how 
Aphrodite meets Anchises. Um, for those of you who don't remember the, the significance of that story, the outcome of um, the, um, the result of the union between Anchises and Aphrodite is, of course, Aeneas. Um, Aeneas, the Trojan hero, um, who is the hero of the Aeneid um, and the, the son of Venus, of course, uh, in, in Virgil. Um, so Anchises is a strapping Trojan lad whom um, Aphrodite comes across. And um, so it's just described her coming down and at her presence when she descends on... It was a little long, so I, I cut this bit, unfortunately. But um, when she descends on the land, all of the animals immediately pair off and go off and mate, right? Um, anyway, but then he continues. But she dimmed her glory and made herself like a mortal woman and came to Anchises and beguiled him, and they went up together into his bed. I think the fox had meant to end here, but the song now had him in its grip, and he went on to tell what followed, how Anchises woke from sleep and saw Aphrodite standing in the door of the hut, now, not now like a mortal, but with the glory. So he knew he had lain with a goddess, and he covered his eyes and shrieked, Kill me at once! Not that this ever really happened, the fox said in haste. It's only lies of poets, lies of poets, child. Not in accordance with nature, but he had said enough to let me see that if the goddess was more beautiful in Greece than in Glome, she was equally terrible in each. Oh, man. Um, so, um, so much going on here. Um, let's focus first on the story. Let's focus first on the story. Um the culmination of the story, like where the story ends, and note, we're not getting the fox's words. She's not quoting the fox. Um, she's not like reciting poetry here, though the fox was wont to do that. She is instead, Orwell, that is, is paraphrasing, right? She is retelling to us the story that, you know, she's paraphrasing for us the story that, um, uh, that the fox had told to her. Um, and the culmination of that story is not just with the fact of the union of the mortal and the divine, right? When Aphrodite beguiles Anchises, the Trojan shepherd boy, they're pretty much all shepherds as far as I can tell. Um, Anchises is a shepherd, Paris is a shepherd, they're all minding their own business, herding sheep apparently. Um, but um, anyway... Uh, the culmination is not the moment of union, right? And not any kind of sense of privilege or, as one might possibly say, grace, right? Uh, a divine love that has condescended down to the human level. An unimaginable kind of love that has been bestowed upon a human person, right? That That's not the reaction of Anchises. That's not what this is a story about, right? The story is when he discovers that he had lain with a goddess, he covers his eyes and shrieks, kill me at once. The... Um, what danger of the meeting of the divine and the human? The terrible danger to humans in that. Um, the unbearable glory of the divine, when it's revealed, um, that humans can't, can't, can't stand, can't tolerate, right? Um, uh, you may remember, uh, if you know your Greek mythology, um, the story of Zeus and Semele. Um, She's Semele is the one. Of course, it's hard to keep track of um, Zeus's side chicks, but Semele is the one whom uh, Juno or Hera d tricks into getting Zeus to make a rash promise. Um, when he comes to her the next time, she says, "Promise me something," and he's like, "Oh yeah, sure, whatever you want." And she says, "Reveal yourself to me in your glory." Right. That's what Juno tricks him into this saying you you know 
you should totally do this. Like, I think you're being played. You know, she's like, sister, you're being played, right? There's like some dude who's, you know, um, seduced you and tricked you into thinking it was Zeus. Like, if it's really Zeus, have him reveal himself in his glory. And, um, and he does. And when he does reveal himself in his glory, Samele is blasted into a greasy spot on the floor. Um, that's what happens when the divine is revealed in its glory um, to humans. Um, okay. Um, in the end, um, in the end, her conclusion, Orowal's conclusion, not Aphrodite's conclusion, um, the fox seems to have intended his story to illustrate the difference. Right? No, 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 no. Aphrodite isn't about temple prostitutes and um, fertility rituals and human sacrifice. No, 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 no. Let me tell you about the Aphrodite principle. Let me tell you a, uh, one of our story, one of the, a tale of our Aphrodite, right? To try to help you to understand on this higher, poetic, beautiful Greek level what this thing is about. And she hears the story and says, if the goddess was more beautiful in Greece than in Glome, she was equally terrible in each. Um, sounds to me like it's pretty bad news to be singled out for special treatment by Aphrodite. Um, Anchises uh, seemed to have a, a mixed experience <laughs> right there. Um, one last thing here. Um, notice the thing that she points to here, and we will see it many times. The fox is a philosopher. The fox is like a stoic philosopher. It's ish, sort of. Um, sort of pre-stoic. Um, he's a philosopher, and he does not believe the stories about the gods. Um, this, of course, you, you can read this sort of thing in Plato, right? Plato talks about this, that the, the poetic stories about the gods, he thinks they're kind of a scandal, right? Like this sort of story. Aphrodite coming down and having sex with Anchises and stuff. He's like, that's, that's, uh, that's not what the divine nature is like, right? Um, I, he believes in that which is a, the divine is that which is in accordance with nature, right? Stories like this are just lies of poets. Lies of poets. It's almost a Plato quotation there. Um, none of this ever really happened, right? Um, it's, just a, it's just lies of poets. Um, and yet, notice what happens when he tells the story. What happens to him, the fox, when he tells the story. I love her reflection as an old woman, remembering when she as a young child was told this, this rather racy story, right? Um, I think the fox had been to end there, right? Like, they went up together into his bed. Let's ask no further questions. The end, right? Um, I think the fox had meant to end there, but the song now had him in its grip, and he went on to tell what followed. Um, the fox admits to liking poetry, but he pretends to like instructional poetry, philosophical poetry, right? Uh, rhymes of lore and that kind of thing, right? Um, but he loves poetic art. He loves stories. And... The idea of the song, once he starts reciting the story, once he starts reciting poetry, he is swept away. Something comes over him. He, the fox himself, encounters something. And this is very Greek. This idea of poetry and song. This is the muses, right? Poetry and song having a grip, becoming that kind of a divine encounter. Right. Um, the idea of inspiration. That's why we use that word. Um, 
the, when the gods breathe into you some of their own divine nature and their own divine insight, and that's what makes a you know a bard, a storyteller, um, a poet. That's what sweeps them away, right? He is a philosopher. He knows what's real. He doesn't believe in any of the stories of the gods. He doesn't believe in local religious practice and superstition. He believes in that which is in accordance with nature. Um, the fox knows what's true and has these things figured out. And yet, when the song gets him in, his gri in its grip, he is overwhelmed by it. Um, and that's an important... So, it's, so we can see embedded... with. So this is a story of a union, a divine and human union, right? And embedded within this story is another little divine and human union in the fox's recitation itself, right? All of these different ways and different places in which the divine and human sort of frontier... Uh, the sort of the frontier zone between the divine and the human. And Orwell's commentary on it all, right? Um, that the goddess, be she Ungut or Aphrodite, is equally terrible in every tradition, right? You don't want to mess with even the fox's own resistance, right? When the fox has his little moments here, um, he doesn't like it. He denies it. Um, he, she can see the kind of the conflict, the lightly, the hypocrisy, right? Him telling himself he doesn't believe these things, telling himself he doesn't like poetry because it tells lies about the gods, but he does, right? Um, even the fox, even though it's endearing, and she kind of loves it about him, right? Um, her her memories of it are affectionate, um, and yet she, um, and yet she's like the the effect. It, even that at the end of the day is not really a very attractive thing that happens, right? When the fox kind of encounters the divine in the reciting of poetry. It makes him untrue to his own principles, and that's very uncomfortable with him. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, Sharon, you're right. Unget and Aphrodite are all inducing and therefore awful. Yes, and to Orowal in both senses, right? Um, last comment, and yet people were talking about holiness. This is a very... St I, I find this very, very striking... Another one of those things that makes many Christian C.S. Lewis fans uncomfortable in this book. How the, how un, how Orwell uses the word holiness in this story. When we had made some progress in our task, the king brought the priest of Ungit in to hear us. Um, the task, of course, is the girls' choir learning the Greek um, uh, marriage bed hymn, right? Um, they're singing a, uh, what's the word? Epithalamian. That's the word. They're singing an, ep an, an epithalamian, a, uh, a Greek marriage poem. When we had made some, it's really a Greek marriage bed poem, which is what most epithalamia are actually about. Um, when we had made some progress in our task, the king brought the priest of Ungit in to hear us. I had a fear of that priest, which was quite different from my fear of my father. I think that what frightened me in those early days was the holiness of the smell that hung about him, a temple smell of blood, mostly pigeon's blood, but he had sacrificed men too, and burnt fat and singed hair and wine and stale incense. It is the ungit smell. Perhaps I was afraid of his clothes too, all the skins they were made of, and the dried bladders, and the great mask shaped like a bird's head which hung on his chest. It looked as if there were a bird growing out of his body. Um, another, again, this, the holiness of Ungit is frightening and repulsive. 
holiness is increasingly, as we will see as the story goes along, almost a, uh, an insult word in Orwell's vocabulary. Um, notice she begins to use it here. Um, she's not defining it. I think that what frightened me was the holiness of the smell. Right? And you're like, what do you mean the holiness of the smell frightened you? And it's only when she goes on to describe it that we begin to see what the word holiness means to Orwell. The word holiness means associated with all of those temple things from Ungit. Blood, burnt fat, singed, singed hair, wine and stale incense stale incense. Even in some ways, the temple prostitutes of Ungit are going to be, be associated with holiness in this, in this same way. It is the Ungit smell. I think that what frightened me was the holiness of the smell. That's what was bad about it. Um, holiness are the, the smells that result from the rituals, the sacred rituals conducted around Ungit. Blood sacrifices, burned, uh, burned fat and corpses of animals, wine and stale incense in this stuffy, dark, enclosed space where the black, faceless, handless rock sits. Um, I totally agree that the holiness of Ungit has a has a, a, a very it, it's a very otherness sense. Uh, very much agree with that. I would draw attention to because it's going to be important later. This mask that the priest of Ungit um, w um, that hangs down around his neck and sits on his chest, the bird's head mask. Um, which makes it look as if a bird were growing out of his body. Um, again, that's going to be an important... This is one of those things I'm just going to flag for you. The idea that the priest of Ungit himself is made to look almost like he is an egg with a bird emerging out of him, right? His chest is... There's a bird growing out of it. It looks like there's a bird growing out of it. Um, that's... Um, just wanted to note that. That's going to be important later. Very creepy as well, for sure. Um, Cal Elros, what a fantastic observation. The priest seems to have two faces, right? Uh, there is his regular face and there is the mask. Um, you are completely correct, Cal, Cal Elros, that we should, um, the title of the book should draw our attention to faceless people, but masks also are perhaps something that we should pay attention to, right? Um, let us, um, it's worth noticing Anything face-related, right, in this story, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, all right, I think that's all I wanted to draw attention to there. Um, do I have time? Yeah, one more. This is the end of chapter one, so let's do this one, then we'll be done. Um... This is when the new queen shows up. I know now that the face I saw was beautiful, but I did not think of that then. All I saw was that she was frightened, more frightened than I, indeed terrified. It made me see my father as he must have looked to her a moment since, when she had her first sight of him, standing to greet her in the porch. His was not a brow, a mouth, a girth, a stance, or a voice to quiet a girl's fear. We took off layer after layer of her finery, making her yet smaller, and left her the shivering white body with its staring eyes in the king's bed and filed out. We had sung very badly. Um, they strip the new queen, leaving her naked uh, in the king's bed. This, of course, would have been common in many cultures. Um, the... Um, in many cultures, the wedding ceremony ends with the bedding. Um, that's, um, yeah. 
it's not just about kissing the bride. Um, in fact, the consummation of the marriage often publicly, I mean, like with before witnesses in any case, um, was often a thing. Um, but um, in any case, remember, remember Anchises and Aphrodite. Remember the emphasis that the king of Glome, her fa uh, Orwell's father, places on the divine blood of their line. They can't marry just anybody, right? The royal house of Glome has the blood of the gods in it, right? They, 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 are, they are related to the gods. That's what makes them kings, right? Um, and they can't mingle their divine blood with just anyone. That's why he's got to marry another king's daughter. Um, uh, and why he uh, is delighted to get the the daughter of the king of Kafad. Um, and uh, she is of divine blood, too. So in that sense, this is a meeting of peers. But the impression of Orwell is of the extremely vulnerable humanity of the new queen. She's a very young girl. And Orwell's father is a very large, very loud, very threatening man. Um, and the presentation of this very young girl um, to the King of Glome, um, she's called girl all the way through this. I, I uh, yeah. Emily, again, thinking historically and the kind of culture that Lewis seems to be describing here, um, I would be shocked if this girl were more than 14. Um, it was very common uh, for uh, girls to be married. I mean, as soon as puberty hits, that is marriageable age. Um, so, in any case, yeah, yeah. Um, Ambrosius, Ambrosius, I agree. So I have to appreciate how uncomfortable Lewis made this whole scene. Yeah, absolutely. This is really uncomfortable. Um, but notice, remember what it's paralleled to. This all maps back onto that sort of divine encounter, right? Um, this is yet one more example. Um, remember human sacrifice to Ungit. This girl is being sacrificed to her father, to Orwell's father, and his desire for a royal heir, right? Um, he has gotten lots of bastards on the slaves of his household. Um, it's not sex that he wants. He gets that whenever he wants it from the slave women um, in the household. Um, it's an heir that he needs, and she is being presented like a sacrifice on that very expensive new sacrificial altar um, that her father has made. Remember the special bed made out of eastern wood uh, designed to um, elicit men, men children? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so the girl, the queen, is presented like a human sacrifice here. Um, but again, it's another... The imbalance, the really, uh, really uncomfortable, the pity that Orwell clearly feels um, for the queen, her stepmother. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, interesting. Curious Chance says, I wonder if after seeing this scene, she's feeling better about being too ugly to marry. Um, she doesn't say that. Explicitly, and yet I, I do think that that factors into it, right? This is her paradigm. This is her introduction to marriage, to what marriage is, to what marriage is to a, to a, to a woman, to a girl in particular, right? Um, what her own fate could potentially be. Um, and notice how that, again, this is another way in which it parallels the meeting of the divine and the human, right? Just as we humans are the helpless victims of the gods who can do whatever cruel um, 
thing they want with us, as she was saying in the first paragraphs. So women are the tools of the men. Um, this girl of her father and Orwell's father who arranged this thing, and now she, the girl, has no choice. She is a victim, just like humans are of the gods. Um, and he, the god, the king, right, the divine king, um, is going to use her for his purposes. Um, and then if he wants, throw her away afterwards. Um, so yeah, that's, that factors in here and where it, it, she's, we don't see any sense yet of her applying this to herself, of her kind of like rethinking her own life choices, right. Or whatever, uh, in the light of this, but it definitely, it definitely, uh, factors in, um, and is going to be, is going to be, is going to, is going to come up later on. You're right. I did miss the fact that they're going to be veiled. That was what the priest of uh, Ungit was interested in hearing the Greek epithalamian was, um, uh, are they going to be veiled, the girls, when they sing? Um, and the father said, yes, nice thick veils. Right. Again, another slanting uh, stab at Orwell's ugliness. Right. They're going to he's going to veil Orwell for sure because she's so ugly. She's going to. She might wreck things, right? Um, but um, but yes, the girls who are in the... so And, and notice how that plays in here. Um, Orwal, Redival, and the other girls who are in the little Greek chorus that uh, the fox has been compelled to try to train and bring together, um, they're all standing there in their veils, faceless in their veils, looking on as the queen is unveiled and unveiled, right? Layer after layer of her finery, and she gets smaller and smaller until sh her shivering white body is revealed with its staring eyes in the king's bed, right? Um, so that 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 contrast, I think, is clearly, clearly important there. Um, and um, and yes, I. Um, oh, someone was asking. Yeah, Cal Elros, I agree. We had sung very badly um, is uh, that's a great line. Um, yeah, Curious Chance was talking about how much he loves that sentence. Yes, it's a phenomenal chapter ending. We had sung very badly. It's a sentence that seems momentarily like a non sequitur, right? I mean, it's just after this long sentence describing describing what has just happened to the body of the queen and leaving you to imagine with a certain amount of horror what is about to happen to the body of the queen. And then the sudden shift to the very short sentence, we had sung very badly. An epithalamion is a blessing on the, you know, the marriage and the marriage bed. Um, that's kind of the idea here. And the awkwardness of their hymn, the badness of their singing, of their performance of this, you know, this Greek blessing hymn um, is at the very least a portent of what is to come later on. Um, okay. Um, I will stop there because although we have not gotten through the first three chapters, actually, there's not too much in chapter three I want to talk about, but chapter two is when we're introduced to, um, to Psyche, one of our main characters. So I do rather want to talk about that. So I'm going to say, I'm not going to try to rush into anything. We'll save that for next time. Um, so let's do, um, let's read through... See, I'm always changing my mind because, um, you know, I never know exactly how far we're going to get. Let's say, let me just look a second here. Let's think about it. I'm thinking through chapter five. Oh, yes. Let's read through chapter five. Chapter five is a big one. An important one. I mean, it's not like terribly long. Um, but yeah, let's read through chapter five. Um, so we'll do, that'll be ambitious. We may not get all the way through chapter five, but let's, 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 let's read through chapter five for next time. Um, no class next week. Uh, no, wait, no, that's not correct. There will be class next week. We'll be good. Yeah. I'm having a moot, but 
Um, this is Wednesday. I'll be back. Um, so, yeah, yeah, we'll be fine. Um, I'll be back from uh, I'll be back from Portland next week. So, next week indeed it shall be. Um, we will uh, we will meet Istra Psyche next time, and then work up towards our big major crisis. Um, I will hope that we get to chapter five, um, the priest of Ungit and the king, because it is a, it is a, an excellent chapter. Anyway, thanks very much, everybody. This was a great deal of fun. Looking forward to continuing. Uh, and I will see you guys next time. Thanks very much. Bye now.